Salam Sejadera from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And thank you all so much for watching this lecture and for joining me uh, as I present to the Harvard Southeast Asia Lecture Series. My name is Kevin Fogg, and I'm gonna be talking today about my current research, Mainline Islam, Islamic Association Life in Indonesia. To give a brief outline of my topics for this lecture, First, I wanna think about religious organizations as the backbone of civil society in a comparative perspective. I'll be bringing the example of America's mainline Protestant denominations to think comparatively about how Indonesian Islamic organizations are structured, the kind of influence they have in society and the kind of challenges that they've faced in the last several decades. That will allow me to then talk about the Indonesian Islamic organizations themselves, both the two big ones you've heard about and some of the smaller ones that you might not have heard about. My own research focuses on three organizations outside the spotlight. And part of the reason that they're outside the spotlight is because they're based outside of Java. So we'll use those three cases to look at the structures of mass Islamic organizations in Indonesia. Think about some of the ways that different organizations are unique, but also the commonalities that they share. That allows us to think about the structures more broadly and to ask the question, what makes Indonesian associational life unique? How are the Muslim organizations in Indonesia unlike the Muslim organizations in any other part of the Islamic world? And finally, I wanna think about the evolution of Indonesia's organizations over the 20th century. Indonesia's had this kind of modern style organization for about 100 or 110 years now. And so thinking about the rises and falls over that century gives us some idea of the ways that Indonesian Islamic organizations have impacted national political life and social life in Indonesia, and also how the vagaries of political life have impacted these organizations. At the risk of getting a little bit autobiographical, I grew up in the American South, going to a big church, thinking about church and seeing the impact of not just my church, but of the denominations of the networks of churches on life across the state of Virginia, across society in the United States, on major political debates, on major social debates. I think a lot of folks who look at America and look at our major institutions have also seen the impact for good or for ill of the large denominations on our national identity, on our national life, and on major institutions. It's Protestant denominations that have founded so many of the institutions that we think about in the United States. The orphanages, the hospitals, the schools, even the universities, including but not limited to universities like Harvard. When we think about denominations that have influenced American life in that major way, the kinds of denominations that are evocative of a Norman Rockwell painting, the kind that you see on the slide here, what we're usually thinking about are mainline Protestant denominations. There's seven of them that have been identified as being at the center of American religious life. And these have been around since the early days of the Republic and continue to be major influences today. Until the mid 20th century, it's understood that the majority of Americans were at least nominally a member of one of these denominations. The term mainline has been around for about a century and it emerged because these seven denominations had a big conference on the train line to the west of Philadelphia. That commuter line is actually called the main line. But the name stuck not just because of the commuter line in Philadelphia, but because the term main line was evocative of the way that these organizations sort of hold the center, they're the mainstream of theological thought, social thought in the United States. And also they're at the center of civil society, of the way that religion impacts broader life. And so they are mainline in multiple ways. My experience of American Protestant denominational life and being involved in how Americans organize themselves religiously made me really interested in the way that Indonesians, Indonesian Muslims specifically, organize their religious life into mass Islamic organizations. And there's two that you might have heard of if you study Indonesia. The world's largest Islamic organization is called Nahdlatul Ulama, which means revival of the religious scholars. Um, it's usually abbreviated as NU. And NU is sometimes called a traditionalist organization. 
because it follows the theology that has accumulated, the traditions that have built up over 14 centuries of Islamic history, specifically in the Shafi'i school of jurisprudence. So one of the ways that you approach questions of Islamic law, but also Islamic theology more generally. The second largest organization in Indonesia is called Muhammadiyah. And they actually have broken out of the traditional schools of jurisprudence, the four classical schools of jurisprudence in Islam. And that comes from the influence of a theological reform movement that built up in Cairo and Egypt, and certainly across the Middle East, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, which then influenced Muslims in Southeast Asia. So Muhammadiyah is sometimes called a reformist or a modernist organization. These two groups are not only super influential in Indonesian national life and with millions of followers, I mean, tens of millions of followers each, but they're also really well represented, I might even say overrepresented in the scholarship on Indonesia and Indonesian Islam. You can see this in books from France or from Japan, scholars based in Australia, Indonesian scholars themselves, like Eka Sri Mulyani or Muhammad Ali, who's now teaching in California, even y'all's neighbors in the city of Boston, folks like Jeremy Menchik and Bob Hefner, have written beautiful studies of Indonesian Islam that really focus heavily on the role of NU and Muhammadiyah as being at the center of Indonesian Islamic life. Although NU and Muhammadiyah are the two largest groups in Indonesia and some of the largest Islamic organizations in the world, they're not the only ones. And in some ways, this research project for me was born not just out of my comparative experience between the United States and Indonesia, but also my experience on the ground in Indonesia, where only NU and Muhammadiyah get any attention, especially at the center, especially on Java. This was epitomized for me by a research fieldwork story told by a friend. He was trying to get the numbers of members in NU. And that's notoriously hard because NU just doesn't keep good records. So he went to the NU headquarters, which is in Jakarta, and he asked them, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find out the number of followers or number of members or number of associates of Nahdlatul Ulama. And he said, oh yeah, hmm. we'll, we'll work on getting that number. Come back to us in a couple of weeks. Uh, go ahead and ask Muhammadiyah, ask the other major organization what their numbers are like. And my friend was also researching Muhammadiyah. So he went to Muhammadiyah headquarters and he asked the folks there. And Muhammadiyah, of course, the organization is very, very clean. Uh, they call it Rapi, right? Organization is very tidy. And so they have all kinds of good records. And so they went through the records. They said, oh, well, if you go by the number of mosques, we have this many affiliated mosques and we have this many affiliated schools and this many students of the schools and this many graduates of the schools. So we would say that our membership or affiliateship is so many, you know, umpteen million Indonesians. He dutifully noted all this down. A couple of weeks later, he went back to NU and asked NU, yeah, have y'all been able to put together the numbers of NU affiliates yet? And his NU colleagues said, um, yeah, have you asked Muhammadiyah what their figures are? And he said, oh, well, Muhammadiyah said, you know, umpteen million, a specific number. And the NU folks said, oh, well, the rest of them are NU, right? Sisanya NU. This is both a joke and a true story, something I was told in the field, but it's also evocative of the way that NU and Muhammadiyah see themselves in the panoply of Indonesian Islam, as though they're the only two organizations. But that's not actually the case. Although NU and Muhammadiyah are large and influential and based on Java, there are actually tens of mass Islamic organizations of the same mold that have grown up across the archipelago over the last century. NU, because it's based in Jakarta, but because its heartland is in Eastern Java, a heavily populous province, and Muhammadiyah with a center in Yogyakarta, these two have captured national political life and they are the two largest. But there are dozens of others that have grown up in different regions since the 1910s and 1920s. So you might have heard of some of these, Parti, Prasatuan Tarbiya Islamiyah in West Sumatra, Pusa in Aceh, Mushawrat al in South Kalimantan, Rabith al-Ulama in South Sulawesi. There were others that were alive just as sort of a flash in the pan. Uh, when I was digging in the Dutch archives a year ago, I found Nahdlatul Shafi'iya, um, the revival of the Shafi'is in Gorontalo, which only lasted for under a decade. 
but was a major influence in that province for that decade and was certainly a major focus of Dutch colonial attention as an um, Islamic concern. The three organizations that I'll be looking at in my research are all based outside of Java and have some interesting characteristics. I think that between the three of them, we capture the nature of minor, not minor, smaller Islamic organizations, certainly smaller than NU and Muhammadiyah. First, um, an organization that was founded in Medan, which is now in the province of North Sumatra, called Jamiat al Washliya. Down on Lombok, the island just east of Bali, there's Nahdat al Watan. And in central Sulawesi, um, there's an organization called Al Khairat, which is actually influential across the island of Sulawesi, parts of Kalimantan, and out to the Malakas, out to the Spice Islands. These three organizations outside of Java, Jamiat al-Washliya, Nahdat al and al khairat each claim to be the third largest in Indonesia. And that also tells us something about how they don't know much about each other. Um, that once you get down to the regional level based outside of Java, folks are just looking towards the center. They're looking towards Jakarta or towards the major national organizations. But these regional organizations don't always recognize each other but they've had a very parallel evolution and they have a number of characteristics that are shared, not only among each other, but also with NU and Muhammadiyah. The oldest of these organizations historically is Al Jamiat Al Washliya. It was founded in Medan um, by a collective of students. It was actually originally founded as a debating society. And they were debating both the new theological trends that were coming into their province but also debating what to do about Christian missionary activity. Medan was then uh, administered as part of Dutch East Sumatra, and it was the gateway to the Batak Highlands. Bataks at that time in the 1920s and 30s, many of them were not yet following a world religion. They were following traditional or local traditions, uh, local religions. And so there was some Islamic presence, but there was a growing Christian missionary activity. And a lot of Muslims in Medan, including the Batak Muslims who founded this organization, saw that as a bit of a threat. So they founded Al Jamiat Al Washliya to debate the theological reforms and to compete with the Christian missionary activities. And an early focus of this organization was social and educational works that would convert Bataks to Islam and that would make Muslims out of the um, Bataks that were following traditional religions. This organization grew like gangbusters in the 1930s through the 1940s and 50s. It was highly active in the revolution. And then in the 1950s, it was really influential, not just in the province of what we think of today as North Sumatra, but also in Aceh, um, down the coast into Jambi and some of Riau. Jamiat al Washliya, though, has had a difficult balance between politics and its social educational mission. So it became a member organization of the Islamic political party Mashumi. And later on, it was one of the constituent organizations under P3, Partai Persatuan Pembangunan, which was the Islamic party under Suharto's new order. And a lot of times the politics have sort of overtaken the organization. They've left their orphanages or their schools um, a little bit fallow while they focused on fighting the political fights. Jamiat al Washliya today is still quite influential. And the secretary, for example, um, the secretary of the Indonesian Ulama Council, the MUI, um, that you've seen at major rallies. If you remember the rallies against the governor of Jakarta, Ahok, um, where an MUI official came out and read the fatwa against Ahok by MUI, MUI Pusat, the National uh, Indonesian Islamic Council. That figure was a Jamiat al Washliya figure. So they certainly have some uh, national credentials, but they're not as strong of an organization as they looked to be in the 1950s. They don't have that deep hold in their areas that they once did. The second organization um, that I'll talk about is Al Khairat. This started out as a school and that was also founded in 1930, but it was founded by an Arab immigrant to Indonesia, a member of the Hadrami diaspora, someone from what is today Yemen, named Sayyid Idrus bin Salman al Jufri. Now Sayyid there is a title, which means that he claims descent, um, direct lineal descent from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Said Idrus came to Indonesia first to trade. And he actually came from a family that had been trading back and forth to the archipelago, um, certainly for decades, we think maybe for centuries. 
But he settled in Indonesia permanently and he settled in Palu, which is today the capital of central Sulawesi. But back then was really a backwater. Didn't have a lot in the way of education, didn't have a lot of, in the way of any institutions. Even the Dutch presence was minor and it was not clear in the 1930s that this would become a provincial capital later on. But Said Idris made it a center for religious life by founding a school that, that taught at a new level of um, Islamic knowledge. It used Arabic as the medium of instruction and Said Idris was certainly a good scholar of Islam, a scholar with deep knowledge of Islam. And so he was able to attract students. He didn't give up his trading activities. So he would travel around um, Sulawesi up to Manado, out to uh, East Kalimantan or what's today North Kalimantan and to the Moluccas. Um, so to um, Ternate, Tidore, the, the Northern Spice Islands. He would go out to do trading and he would take a boat or an ox cart that was full of goods. And he would come back with an ox cart that was full of students for his school. And he would be teaching them the whole way, right? As they were riding with them, um, he would be teaching them about Islam. And in that way, he was able to knit together a myriad of ethnic, smaller ethnic groups across Eastern Indonesia, but under consistent Arab leadership. And Said Idrus and then his son and now his grandson have been the heads of this organization since it became a formal organization in 1956. It's faced some difficult times because certainly Central Sulawesi has seen its share of challenges um, early in the days of the organization. This territory was under control of the PRRI, Permista Rebellion. Um, but it remains strongly influential in not just Central Sulawesi, but especially in North Maluku and Gorontalo and Manado, um, or North Sulawesi, um, as areas that have uh, al Khairat dominance in the Islamic structures of those provinces. And then the third organization I'll talk about is Nahdatul Wata. Um, this one means revival of the nation. And it is in some ways a very nationalist organization and in some ways a very local organization. It was founded uh, also in 1930 as a school by a returning um, haji, so a pilgrim from Lombok, who went on the pilgrimage to Mecca and stayed there for a number of years. He stayed for six, seven, eight years to study um, higher Islamic sciences in the holy cities. And then he came back and wanted to found a school in his home district that used those um, formats, those systems, those techniques, those pedagogies that he had learned in the Holy Lands back in his home. He went to a, a madrasa salafiya, it's called a, a madrasa that was founded by a South Asian immigrant to the Holy Lands of Mecca and Medina. This was based in Mecca, who used modern styles in the school. So it used classrooms, it used grades, it used textbooks. It wasn't just memorizing the classical text and reciting them back to your teacher. So when um, Muhammad Zainuddin Abdul Majid, the founder of Nathatul Watan, founded a school, the school is also called Nathatul Watan, on Lombok. This was really revolutionary. It was a new type of pedagogy, but it was very popular. And so this school grew and grew and it established branch schools. Those branch schools then wanted to found an organization so they could coordinate between all of them. This is similar to what happened with Al-Khairat. And the Nathatul Watan branch schools founded the organization Nafa Fulwatan in 1953, this was actually in some ways connected to national politics. Um, at that time, NU had just broken off from Mashumi as a political party. And Mashumi was desperately afraid that all the people who followed the Shafi'i theological tradition, the Shafi'i Madhab um, School of Jurisprudence would vote for NU as a party and wouldn't support Mashumi any longer. So the national Mashumi leaders kind of poked at Muhammad Zainuddin Abdul Majid and said, please, would you just found an organization then affiliate to us? So that we've got some of those traditional supports in your region. Muhammad Zainuddin Abdul Majid was also really fascinating as a character who blended deep theological commitments that were normatively Arab, right? That he taught in Arabic, that he had spent all of that time in Arabic speaking schools in Mecca, but he was also deeply Sasak. And so he did a lot of things in this organization that were pulling from pre-Islamic or quasi-Islamic or para-Islamic Sasak traditions. He wrote three books of poetry that are constantly evoking the landscape of the island of Lombok with Mount Mjani, with the waterfalls, with the streams of his local area. He used a lot of Sasak traditions to build his charisma on the island. So one of the things about Sasaks is when you pass from one life stage to another, 
there are certain ceremonies you do. And the, the ceremony passing from babyhood into childhood is the first haircut you get. And so Muhammad Zainuddin that Majid would go around to all of these villages administering first haircuts to children, right? Bringing them into childhood. But that would also give him an entree to say, and this child should be sent to a Nahdat al Watan school. They should be educated by Nahdat al Watan as an Islamic organization. Now, Muhammad Zainuddin Abdul Majid lived for quite a long time, to the age of certainly over 90. There's debate about what his exact birth date was. But when he passed away in 1997, there was a crisis in the organization because his intended heir predeceased him by just 40 days. So when Muhammad Zainuddin Abdul Majid passed away, he didn't have someone to inherit this organization from him. And at the um, National Congress of Nathafal Watan, that they had immediately after his passing. One of his daughters, he only had two children. One of, both of them were daughters. One of them, the younger daughter, was chosen as the new head of the organization. Now that was radical in a number of ways, but most notably it was radical because this was a woman who was going to be the head of a mass Islamic organization with millions of followers. Some folks weren't happy about that. And one of the people who wasn't particularly happy about that was actually the older sister who said, I don't want my sister to inherit the entire spiritual legacy of our father. And she had an opening because there was also a lot of contention about a woman being the head of the organization. So that older sister nominated her son, the grandson of the founder at a rival Congress. And that caused a factional split in Nathat al-Watan. So since 1997 or certainly early 1998 at the second Congress, you've had two rival organizations that both call themselves the true Nathat al-Watan with different claims to fame. The one um, centered around the older daughter and, and who nominated her son has been much more influential in part because of its great success in politics. And you see here one of the posters of that grandson who went on to become the governor of West Nusantara province. Um, he's universally known by his, um, his sort of nickname, which is Tuan Guru Bajan, right? So the young scholar, Tuan Guru is the Sasak term for an Islamic scholar, and Bajang means young. Now, Muhammad Zainul Majdi is his name. And he was a two-term governor of West Nusa Tenggara. Now his sister is the uh, lieutenant governor of West Nusa Tenggara. So they've been highly influential, but the conflict between those two organizations has made it a little bit tense. It, it actually sort of spilled over into armed conflict and the transfer I'm into the Reformasi period. It's calmed down now, but it's still a little bit tense between the organizations. So these are the three uh, mass Islamic organizations based outside of Java that are the case studies in my research on mass Islamic organizations. Each of them has millions of followers. They're all influential in their regions, but they're very often not known at the center and they're not known largely to each other. Thinking about these organizations comparatively and also drawing in the national organizations in you and Muhammadiyya has allowed me to brainstorm what are the key elements of Indonesian Islamic mainline organizations and how are they different from organizations elsewhere in the Muslim world. Now, I want to preface this by saying that not all Islamic organizations in Indonesia are mainline organizations. Some of y'all might know FPI from Pembela Islam or Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia. These newer groups are not mainline organizations and they don't meet the characteristics that I'm about to talk us through. But there are an awful lot of organizations that do meet these characteristics. And it's striking to me that I can name at least 10 organizations in Indonesia that meet all four of these conditions. But I have not found a single organization outside of Indonesia, a mass Islamic organization outside of Indonesia that meets all four. Now I'm happy to be challenged on that. Some of y'all might put some forward, but I think that says something about Indonesian mass Islamic organizations being a bit different. So the four conditions that I've formulated, first, these organizations are large, influential, and comprehensive. Second, they are modern in form. Third, the organizations support the state or support the nation, certainly the idea of the state. But fourth, they are not controlled by the state. So let's unpack each of those one by one. So first, Indonesian mainline organizations are large, influential, and comprehensive. 
Now, I think that large and influential sort of explain themselves, right? Y'all know what would constitute a large organization and you can gauge how it's influential. But what does it mean to be comprehensive? Well, this is the kind of organization that looks after all aspects of its followers' lives. And I think Muhammadiyah is sort of normative in this, so I'll use them as an example. You can be born in a Muhammadiyah hospital, go to a Muhammadiyah preschool, attend a Muhammadiyah elementary school, middle school, high school, university, get out of that, found a family, get married at a Muhammadiyah affiliated mosque, do your shopping at a Muhammadiyah um, swalaya, a Muhammadiyah cooperative store, get your checkups at a Muhammadiyah hospital, retire to a Muhammadiyah Pantia Suhan, a Muhammadiyah retirement home, and you can even be buried in a Muhammadiyah cemetery. So Muhammadiyah is comprehensive, all of these aspects of your life they're looking after. And within the organization, they also have councils that think about different parts of Islam. So they're not just thinking about preaching. They're not just thinking about education. They're not just thinking about good deeds or social aid. They're covering all of these bases within one organization. And that's why I would say that these organizations are comprehensive. Muhammadiyah is in some ways the ideal. In fact, some of my um, interlocutors in Indonesia talked about Muhammadiyah being the most comprehensive or the most ideal in this respect. But all of the mainline Islamic organizations aspire to this, and in some ways they achieve it, certainly on their home turf. The second condition is modern in form. Now, sometimes when I say this in Indonesia, my NU friends or my Darada Urshad or Al Khairat friends, they get a little bit prickly, right? In Indonesian, we would say Naik Tanduk, right? Their horns come up because they think, oh, we're not modernists, we're not modern theologically. This point is not about theological positions. It's about structures of the organization. So when I say modern in form, I'm talking about the things that these organizations have that Islamic groups did not have 200 years ago. All of these organizations have a constitution and bylaws. In Indonesian, we call this ade ART, angran dasar, angran batanga. All of these organizations have official positions that rotate from one person to another in a formalized way based on periodic conferences. So those are the supreme head, the secretary, the treasurer, and then they're organized into districts that are actually perfectly consonant with Indonesia's political jurisdictions. So they will have a secretary and a treasurer for each province and a secretary and treasurer for each kabupaten or regency or each kota, um, each city. These um, organizations all have uh, councils, right? So they'll have the Council for Education, the Council for Social Affairs, the Council for uh, Preaching, Propagation. They have a bunch of structures that are inherently modern in form. And that sets them apart from what Islamic association life looked like 150 or 200 years ago in a way that I think is important. My second two conditions are about the relationship of these organizations to the state, or at least the idea of the state. All of the organizations that I'm talking about as mainline Islamic organizations in Indonesia are supportive of the idea of Indonesia. In fact, they're very vested in it. A lot of these organizations fought hard for Indonesian independence during the revolution. They've been involved in Indonesian politics. They've been involved in Indonesian society, and they accept Indonesia as sort of the container in which Islamic life is going to happen. So these organizations also engage in nationalist practices. Nahdlatul Tulwatan probably stands out in this because it has quite so much um, Indonesian patriotic material in its organizational identity. But you can see Indonesian patriotism in NU and Al Khairat, even though Al Khairat was founded by an Arab immigre, by a Yemeni who came to Indonesia, you still see support for the idea of Indonesia in Muhammadiyah, in Jamit al in all of these organizations and the ones that I'm not focused on, you see support for the idea of an Indonesian state, even if they don't support any particular administration that may be ruling at a given time. We have to pair that condition with the fourth condition, which is that none of these organizations are controlled by the state. In this way, they really stand apart from places like Saudi Arabia, even Malaysia and Brunei, where religious life is really dominated by state infrastructure. 
in some ways in Indonesia, you could say that the state infrastructure is dominated by these mainline Islamic organizations. Certainly when deciding what is gonna be the national holiday for um, the end of Ramadan or for Eid al-Adha, it's NU and Muhammadiyah that have the real influence. They're the ones that dominate Islamic life, not the Indonesian state. And so although these organizations are supportive of the idea of Indonesia and of the Indonesian independent state, they're not controlled by it. They have a lot of independent um, free range, even under the Suharto regime, which is the closest Indonesia's really come to authoritarianism, even under the Japanese, these organizations were not controlled by the state. They remained independent actors. Looking at these four conditions, there's no particular reason in the abstract that only Indonesia could sustain Islamic organizations that meet all four of these conditions. And yet I can't find an example of a major Islamic organization elsewhere in the Muslim world that does meet these four conditions. Some parts of the Muslim world, their association life is organized in ways that are still not modern. When we think about uh, West Africa, for example, in Nigeria, in Northern Ghana, we think about Sufi brotherhoods that are very influential, large, they engage with the state, but they're not modern in form. They're still traditionalists and based on that master disciple relationship without the modern structures we see in Indonesia. In other parts of the Muslim world, we see major Islamic organizations that are either ambivalent towards the state like the Tablighi Jama'at in South Asia, or that are antagonistic towards the state like the Ikhwan al-Muslimin have been traditionally in uh, certainly Egypt, but other parts of the Middle East where they've expanded. So I can't find another organization that would meet these four characteristics in the Muslim world. But incidentally, I think all four of these characteristics would also be true about American mainline Protestant denominations. Um, American mainline Protestant denominations are large, influential, and comprehensive. Um, certainly they have been historically. They're modern in form, no doubt. They're supportive of the state, but they're not controlled by the state. So in that way, I think that we can draw an interesting and useful comparison between American Protestant denominations and Indonesian mass Islamic organizations. And I'd be interested to tease that out with you all in the question and answer session. In the limited time I have left, I wanna talk a little bit about the parallel evolution of all the mainline Islamic organizations across the 20th century. Sometimes when folks have focused too closely on NU and Muhammadiyah, they think that some of these things are unique to those organizations. But we can see such commonalities among such a large number of mainline Islamic organizations that it should lead us to step back and think about some of the bigger structures, the larger ebb and flow of religion or specifically Islam in Indonesia's modern history. The first wave of the mass Islamic organizations that I consider to be mainline was in the 19 teens and 1920s, when these things were established largely in competition with Christian missionaries, but also in competition with Muhammadiyah. Muhammadiyah was the first to emerge. And because it carried the banner of reformist theology, some of the traditionalist organizations rose up in competition or in contradistinction to the Muhammadiyah's theological position. One of the ways that these things emerged was to be founded directly as organizations but there was a second pattern of emergence for some of these groups. Among my case studies, this would include al Khairat and Nahdat al-Watan, where first they were established as part of a new wave of schools. Those schools brought new types of pedagogy, specifically Islamic pedagogy, to Muslim communities in the 1920s and 30s. And in some ways, those schools were competing, which, competing with Dutch colonial schools or Christian missionary schools but in other ways they were influenced by trends in Islamic education that were happening around the Islamic world. They brought in formal curriculum, classrooms, grades, diplomas, and certainly a higher level of Arabic fluency, not merely recitation, but actually understanding the Arabic that they would use for theological purposes. These schools would then grow into networks and the networks blossomed into the second wave of organizations in the 1940s and 50s as the graduates of these schools wanted to organize, wanted to collaborate, and also as the leaders of the first school of the, the Skola Induk, right? The founding school 
wanted to create chains where graduates of the branch schools would sort of culminate into that central school, that first school at the higher levels. Creating an organization made it easier to do that. Looking into the 1940s, we see that um, the Indonesian mass Islamic organizations were key contributors to nationalism, especially in the revolution. Some of y'all may know that my first book was on the role of Islam in Indonesia's national revolution. And we see groups like Nafatul Watan, Jemitul Washliya, Muhammadiyah, and you creating militias, um, preaching to their followers, um, and to any Muslim who will listen about the importance of fighting for Indonesian independence and also helping to shape early politics. But the peak of organizational normativity comes in the 1950s. This is in part because Islamic mass organizations are the best way to get into the political game in early independent Indonesia. So a lot of folks are scrambling to create these organizations in a way that will help them in state capture. Once the Indonesian state has established a ministry of religion and you really want your buddies, the folks who are theologically aligned with you, the folks who went to Islamic schools with you, to get into the plumb positions of that state bureaucracy of the Ministry of Religion. And it's best to have an organization which will help you to box out, which will help you to angle your people into those posts. So in that way, the creation of organizations or the solidification of organizations was really dovetailing on the solidification of a religious bureaucracy in the Indonesian state. At that time in the 1950s, a lot of these mainline Islamic groups had all of the organizational trappings that we associate with 1950s American Protestantism. They were creating their own songs, a lot of which were actually sort of marches. Um, they had their own scouting troops. They had um, auxiliaries or affiliate organizations for women and for young women and for youth and for teachers and for scholars. Some of them had affiliate organizations for fishermen or for farmers. I mean, they really had all of the trappings of organization life to the hilt that one could want in a way that for me felt very evocative of what we think of Protestant denominations having in the West and certainly in the United States. But after that, from the 1960s with the transition to the new order under Suharto and certainly into the 1980s, it was a bit of a political wilderness. Um, Suharto was deeply skeptical of Islamic organizations. Mashumi as a political party had been banned in 1960. And so the groups that had been affiliated to Mashumi were suffering from that blow. They lost some of their political influence. Even NU, which had remained separate from Mashumi and remained a political party until the fusion in the 1970s, was struggling to carve out a place for itself in the new order established by Suharto. And so they didn't do very well, especially in the 1970s and 1980s. That period also coincided within the organizations with a difficult generational transition in a lot of cases. In Nafat al Watan, although Muhammad Zainuddin Abdul Majdi, uh, uh, Abdul Majid was around until the 1990s, he tried in the 1970s to pass it on to one of his sons in law. Didn't take, he had to take it back over. Um, that was a sign of a difficult generational transition. In um, Jamiat al Rashliya, based in Medan, they had a first generation of leaders. It wasn't a single group or a single family, but they had a first generation that was passing away in the 1960s and 70s. And they had to find new leaders to take on the mantle of this organization. Same thing with Al Khairat based in Palu. Um, Said Idrus bin Salman al Jufri passed away in 1969. He handed off to his son, um, Sayyid Muhammad. But Sayyid Muhammad passed away in 1975 and it got handed off to a grandson. So you had two um, transitions of supreme leaders within one decade. Um, so that's part of what contributed to the troubles that I think a lot of Islamic organizations, certainly mainline Islamic organizations, were experiencing from the 1960s to the 1980s. Now that turns around in the 1990s when Islam comes back in national politics, and certainly we talk about the greening under Suharto and his new green generals in the 1990s. But they also are contributing to new trends in national life. You know, in the 1990s, we get a lot of urbanization. And as folks move from rural communities into towns and cities, they're looking for organizations that they know and recognize. And many of them will stick with organizations, Islamic organizations, that they've either gone to the schools of or recognized from their home communities. Groups like NU, Muhammadiyah, Nahdlatul Watan, 
Darla or Shad, Purti. I mean, there's many more of them beyond just the case studies that I've pulled. These are also guardians against, um, against sort of trends in Indonesian society that were accused of being excessively modern or Western, excessively liberal. And they're connecting also to um, transnational networks that challenge these mainline groups, right? As we see the rise of FPI in the 1990s and 2000s, Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia in the 2000s, there's a debate but NU, Muhammadiyah, and the regional organizations that are mainline become the bastions of sort of old core um, Islamic thinking, Islamic activity, Islamic civil society in Indonesia, and they hold the center. So this is some of the evolution across the 20th century that I think is parallel across all of these organizations. By stepping back and looking at it, we can see that you know, some of the difficulties that NU Muhammadiyah had in the 70s and 80s, for example, as outlined in Bob Hefner's book on civil Islam, were not distinct to those organizations. They were really broader trends and speak to religious life more generally in Indonesia. So to wrap up, I want to ask first, how does mapping these mass Islamic organizations, these mainline Islamic organizations, help us to understand Indonesia's place within the Muslim world? Because I believe that the type of affiliation life, the type of association life that we see among Indonesian Muslims is really different and distinct from other parts of the Islamic world, I think it's worth asking how that has contributed to Indonesia's theological understandings of Islam. How do those structures impact the theology? And also how do they set Indonesia apart from even its close neighbors like Malaysia and Brunei, which have evolved really differently in, in those ways in terms of associational life. I also think it's interesting to ask how uh, useful is the analogy to mainline Protestant denominations in the US? In some ways, these are structures that are born out of similar circumstances. In other ways, these are structures that might have been sort of copied from one to another. Certainly we know that in the early days, Muhammadiyah was copying some of the structures of the Dutch Protestant denominations that were functioning as missionary organizations in Indonesia. Can doing a comparison between American civil, civil society built on the back of religion and Indonesian civil society built on the back of religion help us to think about the um, democratic societies that each of these countries has seen for a couple of decades now or not. Those are some of the things that I hope we'll be able to discuss in the question and answer. Thank you all so much for your attention throughout this lecture. If you'd like to get a hold of me, I'd be happy to chat via email or you can read a bit more about my work on my website, kevinwfog.net. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.